Hey everybody, welcome back. Hope everybody's been having an outstanding week and I wanna welcome everybody to episode two in our deep dive into snake behavior. Our first video was kind of an overview, introduction about the things that we're gonna talk about in this series. And today we are going to be talking about what snakes do when they sleep, how they sleep, how we can recognize it and how it impacts how we need to interact with them. So don't go nowhere jump down, get subscribed to the channel so you can follow along, and let's talk about snake sleep today on Intrepid Exotics. Whether you're a lifelong keeper or just getting started, help us encourage responsible keeping, conservation, and public education in the interest of keeping our reptiles safe and healthy as we protect them for future generations. You're invited to spend time with us as we experience these awesome animals together on Intrepid Exotics. So Athena here, my juvenile Burmese python, is going to hang out with me today. Um, with no small level of distraction, I'm sure everybody's just going to sit here and watch me let her roll over my hands for the whole video. But um, I do like to have one of these guys out a lot of times when we're talking, since we're talking about snakes. And she's such a sweet girl, she loves to get out. But today's topic on sleep is kind of interesting, and there's not a ton of available conclusive research on the topic in general. It's been a bit of an enigma, even for people. You know, why do we sleep? What happens? Uh, what's, what's the purpose for it? But throughout evolutionary history, it's been determined that just about every animal sleeps in one way, shape, or form. And that also applies to our snakes. Now, it's really interesting too, when you think about it, because, um, when we talk about evolutionary pressures on animals, then it's, it's really, really interesting to think that an animal being asleep is such a, um, is such a disadvantage when it comes to things like predation and things like that. Uh, you know, if you can think about it, you know, if you go out, you go out into the hood, you're in a bad neighborhood, you're not going to just lay down on a picnic table go to sleep because chances are you're going to wake up without, uh, without your wallet, maybe without your shoes, if you're sleeping in your car, maybe you wake up without your hubcaps. If you're an animal sleeping out in the wild and you go completely unconscious and unalert, um, you're going to be something's dinner. So it's really interesting to think that something that makes an animal so vulnerable to predation is clearly necessary. Um, and like I said, I haven't seen a whole lot of real conclusive uh, research done to determine why that is. Now, when we talk about sleep, we're going to hear a couple different things like um, REM sleep, REM sleep, uh, non-REM sleep. All that, all that means is it's an acronym for rapid eye movement. Um, you know, if you're in a light sleep, then you're maintaining, you know, your, your fairly normal muscle tone. You, you may not be conscious per se, but your body hasn't really drifted off into that deeper sleep, which is REM which is a state where you know you lose your muscle tone, your body's completely pretty much shut down except for autonomic functions. And for some reason that's associated with rapid eye movement. And what that, what that is for us is called um, bihemispheric slow wave sleep. And that means that both hemispheres of our brain pretty much shut down, go to sleep, and we rest completely. Now, not every animal does that. You'll see some aquatic mammals and birds that um, experience what's called unihemispheric sleep. And that means that only one side of their brain goes to sleep at a given time. Um, so they're resting, they're alternating times of this side of their brain sleeping that side. It's noticeable by sometimes you'll see them with one eye closed and the eye that's associated with the conscious part of their brain is actually open and alert while the other side is resting. A really good example of this is in dolphins. And it's really interesting because um, you know, dolphins can stay submerged you know, roughly 15 minutes or so before they've got to come back up and breathe, but they don't have autonomic breathing like humans do. They've got to consciously decide to breathe. That means that they could only sleep Otherwise, for you know, no more than 15 minutes before they've got to wake themselves up, go up and take a breath. If they breathed automatically, since they need air, then they'd go to sleep, 
they'd inhale a bunch of water and they drown essentially. So, and you'll see, and it's really cool. I've seen a couple of videos that I was not able to find for this that shows, you know, how they'll swim along. They'll actually have half of their brain sleeping and the other half engaged in moving and things like that. So just to just kind of make that distinction, since we're talking about sleep, I thought it was an interesting point. Now with snakes, of course, they don't have any eyelids and we can't look at them, see that their eyes are closed and say, okay, well, this animal's sleeping. Our lizards, we can do that. I can go downstairs with Niles and see him in his water, propped up on the side, eyelids closed, really slow breathing, Niles is asleep. Uh, needless to say, that doesn't work with our snakes. So how do we tell if our snake's sleeping and how does that impact the way we interact with them, how we need to approach them, things like that. So one thing to understand, of course, going all the way back to the basics is of course, snakes tend to be ambush predators. They'll sit still and silent in one spot waiting for a prey item. And it can be really hard to distinguish that state that they're in where they may be relaxed and motionless and observing, looking for a prey item or where they're being completely, you know, where they're completely asleep. Um, a couple clues, and I'm going to show an example of this on Chloe here in a second, but a couple clues that we can look for to determine whether our snake's sleeping or not is, of course, if they're laying motionless in the same place for a long time, which they do frequently, um, and they're doing so with their pupils much smaller, closed off a little bit to kind of restrict some of the light that's coming in, and they can be non-reactive. And this is a really good example of this in this part that I'm gonna put up in a second, where you can go out and move around them. If they're asleep, they're not gonna react. This is one of the things that um, you know, leads me to believe that snakes experience bihemispheric sleep where their entire brain kind of goes to sleep. Otherwise, if half of their brain was always on, then you literally wouldn't be able to go up without them reacting to you in some way. So they probably experience sleep in much the same way we do. It's my understanding from everything I've read, snakes can sleep up to like 16 hours a day. Uh, we all know that their metabolism is, you know, much slower being um, exothermic as they are and their metabolism being generated from the outside. Um, it operates much, much slower than ours does. If we only ate once a week, we'd be in trouble. So they're, they're known to sleep for pretty long periods of time. But how does this affect when we go to interact with them? Um, I'm gonna go ahead and roll this video really quick just so I can kind of demonstrate this and then we can talk about it on the other side. So this is Chloe. She's our lavender female reticulated python and she is exhibiting every sign of being asleep. We're just gonna sit outside the enclosure for right now and look at her. You can see that She's not reacting to me. She's not coming up to the glass. Her pupils are very, very closed right now, limiting the amount of light that comes in. She's got really shallow respiration and just, by all accounts, appears to be completely asleep. I say she's not reacting to anything that's going on around her. Now we're gonna go ahead and watch her behavior. I'm fairly certain just as soon as I open up this door, she's gonna wake up. And you can expect any number of reactions from a snake when they first wake up the same way from a person. Some people will wake up really groggy and really slow to wake up. Some animals will uh, have a really quick reaction. Yep, there we go. Good morning, sweetie. Sorry, had to wake you up for the video. You can see she reacted right away, came right over. See how her respiration is starting to pick up now? Her whole frame of mind changed. Her eyes opened up, the pupils in her eyes opened up, and you can see her breathing now. So this is a natural reaction for a snake instinctively because when they're out sleeping in the wild, they're naturally, I mean, that's, that's when they're the most prone to predation. 
So when they wake up, their mind shifts and they instantly go into, you know, a potentially defensive mode with her, even as sweet as she is. Um, coming up out of a weight, you can see her anxiety levels up. I woke her up. So this is a really good example of uh, being able to recognize when your snake's sleeping and understanding that um, you know, there's always a potential to take a defensive strike. If you go in and you wake up your snake, you know, say for instance the door didn't wake her up, then uh, if I would just, just reach in there with her sleeping, see? She's still got that natural kind of hesitant demeanor about her. And this is a snake that crawls right out of her enclosure and crawls up on my shoulder all the time. So no matter how good of a relationship you have with them, we still have to be able to recognize and respect um, their frame of mind. Coming out of sleep is a, uh, is a frame of mind we have to pay attention to. So as you can see, you know, Chloe is one of my favorite animals. She's the animal that I've got the best understanding with. I think one of the best understanding. I mean, Athena here, we're, we're pretty much there too. I've raised her since she was a hatchling. But you can see the way Chloe reacted there. She was dead asleep and was completely non-reactive to me going around her enclosure. And as soon as I opened that up and she felt those vibrations of that door opening, automatically on point, wide awake. Now, we've all got those instincts that will kick in sometimes. Um, you know, you, you hear people talk about it all the time, especially, you know, combat vets are like, you're not gonna wake up in the middle of the night and, and strangle me, are you? I had some bad experiences at camp, so now I sleep with one eye open. Um, <laughs> and, and you get that because animals have got, you know, that natural, um, that natural tendency to when they wake up and there's something in their face, they know they've got a fight or they're about to get eaten. Now that same instinct will kick in with our snakes. So if we go in and we don't see them cruising, we don't see them really active, like, okay, well, a snake doesn't have a food response. I'm good to interact with them. And we go in and that snake's sleeping and we reach for him. When that animal snaps awake, it's really possible that that natural instinct to defend themselves can kick in and you can take a defensive bite just as soon as they wake up, no matter how good of a relationship you've got with that animal. So it's really important to, you know, look in and just understand that just because they're not doing anything, just because they're not looking like they've got a hot food response doesn't mean that they're safe to approach at that moment. That's another good thing to, to uh, Another good habit to get into with using the hook. You know, if you open the door to the enclosure and the snake still isn't moving, you don't see any tongue flicks, you don't see any accelerated respiration or anything, there's a good chance he just didn't wake up and you need to go in there with that hook and tap him off to the side a little bit. Get them moving, nudge them a little bit, just make sure that they're, you know, awake and, and just like we talk about, give them a couple minutes to kind of understand what's going on before you just reach in and snatch them out of the enclosure because, it's the same way if we're getting up for work or school. You know, if somebody wakes us up, we want them to, hey, come on, off the microphone. <laughs> Just intent on messing with the microphone. Come on, girl, work with me. <laughs> but, um, you know, if, if somebody wakes us up, we want them to kind of nudge us a little bit and kind of say, hey, you know, wake up. We don't want them just grab us by the arm and snatch us, pull us right out of bed. Uh, high likelihood that's gonna, that's gonna be a bad start to the day. So it's the same way with our snakes. Uh, so kind of to summarize what we're talking about, I mean, there's, <clears throat> I, I think sleep is so common and most people have heard, you know, many of the terms associated with it. It's not that complicated, but it is one of those things where when we're working to understand snake behavior, it's one of those things that we've gotta be able to recognize. So what you're looking for to determine if your snake is sleeping or not, there's not gonna be any tongue flicking. You're gonna see really small pupils where they've kind of closed off to seal off from the light. Really slow respiration. They'll be in the same spot for a long time. They won't be reactive when you're moving around them and stuff like that. And so when you see them in that state, make sure that you're giving them plenty of time to figure out what's going on. Um, 
and it's going to make the whole experience better for everybody. So the next video in our series is going to be on the dreaded food response, especially with snakes like reticulated pythons. They've got that feared food drive, that food response, and you've just got to make sure you're getting in there and tapping them down every single time, because if you don't, you're going to take a food response, they're going to bite you and wrap you, and it's going to be terrible. Well, there's a couple things to understand about that. Just like with everything else that's kind of subjective, like reading behavior, there's nuances to it and food responses can be managed pretty easily. So that's gonna be the next topic that we go into in our series. And I'll probably get down with, uh, with Monty, our, our, big, uh, our big female reticulated python, and look at some stuff with that. I may add in some feeding videos just so that we can um, kind of see how they approach it, uh, which should be a lot of fun. And of course, I don't do any live feeding, so if you're, if you're here looking for any of that, just go somewhere else. Uh, we just do everything I feed is frozen thawed. It's safe, it's humane, and that's our preference. But that's going to be part of the discussion in the next episode, talking about uh, food responses and our snake behavior series. So you guys, don't forget, jump down, get subscribed to the channel, throw down any comments, questions you may have, like the video, get it out to more folks. And we will see you next time with episode three on Intrepid Exotics.